Thank you for listening to Dream 10X Radio, where we interview people attempting to live extraordinary lives. Our twofold purpose is to both direct and inspire people bold enough to do the same. Dream 10X. Face your fears and make your life count. Our guest today is a 1994 graduate of the University of Maryland and co-founder of Riverbed Technologies, which sold for just under $1 billion, only six short years after he completed his undergraduate degree. He has been a bit of a serial entrepreneur entrepreneur since, serving as the CTO of OmniSky and then starting Reality Mobile and, and being the CEO there for that company and then serving as a principal solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. He is now the Senior Director of Engineering at Google and lives in San Francisco, California with his wife and three kids. Please welcome Dave Renson. Dave, it's been decades since we've talked. Welcome. It's been a minute. How are you, James? (laughs) Good. It's great to hear from you. So, uh, California from Virginia, what's the transition been like for you? Uh, they are very different places. Yeah. Um, I like to tell people that um, in Virginia, a profit is what you get when you sell something for more than it costs you. And in California, a profit is the guy with the really long beard on the whiteboard <laughs> telling you why all your ideas are wrong. <laughs> That's good. And uh, each coast could use maybe a little bit more of the other. Yeah. Well, look, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on our podcast is because, um, well, just to set the context, I started working for you in around 1998. I, I worked for Boeing for five years, uh, right out, you know, right when I finished school. And uh, I was doing government contracting work here in Virginia. And I interviewed with you and Greg Sally and Doug Morrison in a small room in Falls Church, Virginia. And you guys were telling me about some crazy mobile startup you guys are doing. And I had no idea that uh, I was going to be good enough to come work with you guys. But uh, thankfully, you made me an offer letter and I got to work for Riverbed Technologies, um, developing a a synchronization platform for Palm and other mobile mobile devices. And it was one of the best experiences of my career so far. Um, And even today, you are one of the smartest and most successful technical people and probably business people that I've ever had the privilege of working with. And so I wanted to to, get up more. (laughs) I wanted to pick your brain a little bit more about what makes you you. And I want to hear a little bit more about your childhood. And, And as a kid, I was I was into computers and robotics and all that stuff. And so I can definitely trace it, trace my technical bent back to my childhood. And I'm I'm wondering if you were kind of the same or. Were you yeah, different? Sure. Or? No, 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 for for sure. Um, I the first time I programmed a computer was let's see, I was born in seventy two, so I think the first time I programmed a computer was late seventies, like on an Apple II. Mm. You know, I kind of remember being in some summer camp or something. Yeah. Um, and I've always loved computers, um, and so uh, you know, I've been writing software professionally for them since uh, eighty nine, I guess. Since since I was a senior in high school or junior in high school, so really, the first time someone paid me money to write software and did it all throughout college and you know most of my professional career. So yeah, and it was definitely something I well, I mean, I don't know about other people, but but for me, it's a deeply satisfying experience and it's kind of a no risk experience because I mean, what's the worst that happens if it doesn't go right? You erase it and start over. Hmm. Like all all you've spent is time. It's not like you know uh, if you're painting a fresco on a wall. And you get it wrong. Like, then you have a real decision about, like, how are you going to fix it? You can take the whole thing down, like, you know, or, um, or like, what's another creative endeavor? Like cooking. Like cooking's a thing I never understood. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I love to eat. Well, I, and if you, if you could see me, you, you'd know, but, um, <laughs> but I don't understand it. Right. Cause you, you spend all this effort just to destroy the thing you created. Mm. Uh, so that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense to me, but, mm. um, no, it absolutely, uh, I've been technical since I was a kid. My dad was a, a ham radio operator when he was a kid. I got my ham radio license. My brother and I both did it when I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 maybe. Learned to hmm. solder since I was seven or eight. Wow. Where'd you grow up? Uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. So oh, really? Okay. Uh, for, for your listeners, that's about 20 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. Yeah. That's real close to us. We're in Alexandria, Virginia right now. 
Oh yeah, yeah. That's I mean, you know, within thirty or forty minutes. Yeah, and Cindy works for Noah, so she's she knows that area pretty well. Oh sure. Yeah. Um. So, professional professional software writing as a high school student. Who was paying you money then? Uh, a small accounting firm wanted to. Uh, so let's see. My older brother and I couldn't tell you how he did this started co-writing computer books from the early 80s no kidding the 80s. yeah he did a a book on the compact computer and the hp computer and one or two others huh. uh and so he kind of he knew a bunch of people and there was a local accounting firm that uh wanted to use this program called fox pro yep. which was okay well for a lot of people i mean i know it was a kind of a desktop database sort of a precursor to like uh Microsoft Access, let's say, mm. and um, it had its own programming language and it could compile. It was a really kind of an interesting thing, and uh, I had a copy of it, and I was actually pretty good at it. And they needed some software, and I was pretty good, and so they paid me money to write them software. Interesting. That's really cool. So, would that feel like to get paid to actually do something you like to do? Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> that was that's so much better than mowing grass. Or something. <laughs> yeah, totally. Wow. So uh, w was that a point where, was that a turning point for you or you knew what you kind of wanted to do after you finished all your school? No, uh, when I went to school, so that's a, that's a long and winding tale. Um, I originally was going to go to a different school on a wrestling scholarship. And Interesting. then uh, three weeks, four weeks before the end of my senior year, I tore my rotator cuff throwing shot put in track. Hmm. Uh, and the school was like, well, you can come here like you have the grades, but, uh, you can't have the scholarship because at a minimum you need surgery and we're not going to redshirt you for a year. Mm. And, uh, I was, you know, I'd already said no to all the other schools. And so, um, at the time the university of Maryland, which is my local school, uh, wasn't as difficult a school to get into as, uh, as it is now. I understand it's pretty hard now, but back then it kind of wasn't, if you were a local, it was sort of your safety school. And they're like, yeah, sure. You know, we'll, we'll take, we said yes before we'll say yes again. Um, and I went originally in, uh, for a, a finance degree in the school of business because I figured anything I did would be a business and you know, you got to keep right. money. That's uh, what I tell my I, kids. Yeah. And I thought I would, honestly, I thought I'd probably go be a lawyer. My dad was a lawyer. Um, and huh. so I was pretty familiar. Um, and then I started working in school, uh, writing software. Because uh, that's what I, I like to do and love to do, and got paid for that all throughout school. And no kidding, yeah, it was really, really bad in finance. Well, not really bad, but I couldn't get past uh, cost accounting because it made no sense to me. It still makes no sense to me. Um, and I couldn't be a finance major anymore because you had to pass cost accounting. When I say I couldn't get past it, I don't mean I couldn't get an A. I mean I couldn't get past it. I took it twice mm. and failed it twice. Only Interesting. Times I ever failed in my life. Yeah, and so. Um, and I wanted to graduate on time, and the only major that was left that I could switch to and get out on time was statistics. So I wound up graduating with a, st with a, a statistics degree, hmm. which turns out to have been super useful. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it, so many people have the same story where, you know, there are certain classes that just provide so much of a barrier to getting through that, you know, you just kind of kind of got to be like water sometimes and go around the problem and find some other class you can get through. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, writing software in college, who were you writing that for professionally? Uh, I work for the university. Yeah. I worked oh, in, you work the, for the uh, in a computer lab for okay. the school of engineering. Yeah. You know, doing basic systems administration, writing system software, that kind of stuff. I got to do some, I got to do some cool stuff. Like, um, there was, well, people won't know what some of these words mean, but there was a window, windowing, graphic applications and windowing applications were pretty new in the early 90s. And uh, there was a windowing system on Unix called Mosaic or uh, Motif was the windowing system. Mm. Right? And uh, I got to port Motif, this windowing system, to this new hardware that IBM had brought out. And one of the things you would do to make sure it worked, one of the applications you would run uh, was this weird new thing called a web browser. Uh, and so I got to go poke around at the web browser for uh, what later became what was uh, Netscape, which was originally called Mozilla. And it was Netscape and then it was Mozilla again. But, um, and so that was awesome. You know, I got to really see the internals uh, Netscape in like 92, 93, early 94. 
That was kind of neat. You could really see this web thing was probably going to catch on. So Motif was written in C, right? Yeah, yeah all of it was all written in so, C and very occasionally C++. How does a business major learn how to port C code in college? Well, My daughter is remember, a business major, and I cannot see her even having a clue. Um, I, was a, I was a business major because that's what I had to be, right? And, uh, well, I, I started as a business major cause I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I was a statistics major in the school of business cause that's what I had to be to get out of school on time. But I was yeah. always writing software and I, I loved yeah. writing software. And, you know, if you want to write software that is small and fast, uh, and works kind of every place you write it and see, okay. right. You know, ANSI C has got 32 keywords. That's it. <laughs> um, and so if you can write in C, if you can allocate your own memory and do all the things that you have to do to write good, efficient C code, you can be a pretty decent software software programmer. And so, yeah, I wrote a lot of C. I wrote, because I was doing systems administration, I wrote a ton of Perl. Mm. Just, I, I probably wrote, I don't know. I, honestly, I bet I wrote 100,000 lines of Perl. Wow. In my last couple of years of college. <laughs> wow. Well, it's so quick and easy to use. Yeah. How did you go from Fox Pro to, to learning C? Well, this idea that I could tell the computer to do a thing and it would do it. And if it didn't do the thing I told it to do, it's because I told it the wrong thing. Like, cause it would always, you know, the computer always does exactly what you tell it. So if it doesn't do what you want, you told it the wrong thing, mm -hmm. you know, and Fox pro was fine, uh, but pretty limited. And, and when it compiled, the executables were gigundous and, um, it just, you knew, or I knew anyway, that it was clearly going to be pretty limiting. So it's just, you just ask the question, what does everyone else write in? Hmm. So, you know, I didn't go straight from Fox Pro to C. I think I went like uh, Fox Pro. And then probably the first thing I wrote software in in college was Visual Basic. Yeah. Because Fox Pro was on Windows and Visual yeah. Basic was on Windows, right? Okay. And so that's kind of sort of easy. And then, you know, you talk to other people who write software and they're like, well, that's cute. That you're using that Visual Basic <laughs> thing, but like real software is written in this thing, Unix C. Uh, wow, yeah, on this thing called Unix, and it's like, what is Unix? Um, I thought Unix were just a group of guys, you know, uh, who guarded royalty. <laughs> I mean, I it's how, not. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how PG your podcast is, so I won't go any further than that. <laughs> it's all right. Look it's that all up good. on Wikipedia, kid. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, so I learned what Unix was, and uh, and that was weird, right? Like, this isn't anything like DOS. Um, but that's yeah. cool. <laughs> and you know, if you're going to write software on Unix, you're, you're writing it in C. You just are, or were then anyway. Uh huh. That's awesome. And then, then to be working with Netscape too, that was such an exciting time. Oh, it, it was, I mean, it was, I just talked to a bunch of students and, um, they're all kind of down about stuff. And I, I said to them, I don't think you understand. You're the luckiest students in the last 25 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I'm like, look, when you get to be old like me, you'll look back and see that there were a lot of these really important moments, sort of these epochs in your mm. life, right? And you can, I can point out, I don't know, a dozen of them probably. But rare is the case when you are living through history and have the gift of knowing you are living through history. Mm. That happens really super rarely. Uh, and the last time I can think it happened is kind of like when I was getting out of school in 94. Like this internet thing was coming and used it mm -hmm. for a couple of years. I kind of knew what it was and anyone who'd used it knew that, oh, okay, this is going to be like, things are going to be different in not very long. Um, and everything else that's been interesting after that until now, you know, in the middle of, you know, COVID isn't what makes things interesting. I mean, COVID makes a lot of things interesting, but that isn't what makes things interesting. What makes it interesting is that it's pushing over the edge a bunch of things that have been knocking on the door for a while. Like we've been talking about remote work for a while. Well, right. COVID just made it the thing. We've yeah. been talking about remote learning for a while. Well, yeah. COVID just made it the thing. Remote medicine, you know, all these things. Right. Um, and so I, that, that's what I was telling them. So, I mean, I do feel very lucky. I feel like I was, you know, I was part of that other really lucky generation of people. Huh. Let's go there for you a know, second. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go, finish your thought. There. I was going to say, just, just curious, weird, fun fact. One of my... Uh, classmates i didn't know him like so i don't want to say i did but one of my classmates at maryland at the same time was sergey brin no kidding you knew him yeah, co-founder of google no no i did not uh-huh so was he we were in one or two of the same classes but the same year as you or yeah i think he graduated in 94 like no kidding that's yeah. pretty cool man that's really cool so yeah there was you know that was a really lucky generation to be in yeah especially at university of maryland that's 
Apparently oh. so. Yeah. Before that, the, the before that, the two famous, the two most famous alumni in Illinois, of Maryland, were uh, were uh, uh, Jim Henson and uh, Connie Chung. Those were the like when you saw the Maryland recruiting brochure in the early. No days, kidding. That's what they talked about. Yep. Wow. <laughs> I wanted to go down the little rabbit hole real quick about remote work. Yeah. So we've had the capability to do remote things for a really long time, but it just hasn't taken off, and it's taken a a pandemic to kind of push us there. What What do you yeah. think has been the the sticking point on that up to this it's point? It's just a lot of cultural change. Yeah, and why, why do you think we've adopted that sooner though? That change because it's a lot of friction. It's a lot of cultural. Like a lot of companies are founded on the idea that having people together in the same physical place creates this intangible intellectual benefit. They can talk to each other. There's sort of the serendipity that was. You know, if you read any history of Bell Labs, they'll they'll say like it was all built that way so people could run into each other and they're you know these these sort of probably apocryphal stories of shockly running to someone else and that's how the transistor came about and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, and also keep in mind like this has been the organizational model of 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 companies since there have been companies. Yeah, right. The the modern company, as you think of it, isn't much more than a hundred years old, and those all started you know when. It, when most companies were industrial concerns. So everybody was together on the factory floor and then mm. the managers were close to the factory and it's close to the workers, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And it's just been very slowly. And we've had some of the tools for remote work, but some of them are really quite new. Like there hasn't been, uh, I think, good remote video conferencing that you could use from a computer in your home. Mm. You know, we've had Cisco and Tanberg systems and things you can install in conference rooms. But really, what, I mean... Could you imagine, let's see, what's something from sort of my era? Could you imagine using something like CUC Me or something for remote work? Like that, that's not going to work. You need yeah. kind of a Zoom or a Google Meet or whatever. Uh, so that hasn't been there. Uh, you know, the way we do knowledge work, um, you know, stop and think about it. When you and I were working together, source control systems were things that sat in your enterprise on a server mm -hmm. and had to be backed up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now everyone uses Git or something Git or one of its competitors. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sit on-prem almost usually. Uh, the cloud, you know, the cloud is only really the last 10 years for most people and the mm -hmm. last five years really for most people. So, you know, I don't know that most of the things you would need to make it doable uh, existed more than four or five years ago. And even still, you know, if you've been doing the same thing for a hundred years and it looks like it's working, you're not likely to want to run a giant experiment. That's but good also point. remote. Yeah. And also remote work is one of those things um, that everybody has to do or it can't work. Uh, and so if you're a company, you're not going to run this experiment where you go, okay, for three months, everyone's going to remote work. Why? I don't know. Cause it could work and we're going to try. Like you're not <laughs> going to do it. Yeah. It's just, it's too risky. And, but the problem is, is only if, if like 5% of your population is doing remote work, they are, sort of permanently disadvantaged and so it'll never look like it works mm. so you need something like shelter in place to force people to do it mm, interesting yeah it's weird in your opinion the, does it does remote does a remote workforce put a company at a, any kind of disadvantage um i i think there are new cultural norms we're all going to have to learn and i don't know what they are yet but I do know that the norms we had when we were together in an office are not can't be the same as when we're all sitting roughly in the same chair on a video conference. And I can't tell you what they're all going to be. Like that's going to be things that emerge over the next, I don't know, five or ten years probably. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of like online etiquette. Um, so I, it's early for that question. But, you know, the interesting thing is it kind of doesn't matter. Like we don't have a choice anymore. And the fact is, it, well, people ask me, you know, do I think companies go back to like how they were on January 1st of this year? This is, you know, 2020, by the way, for people who are listening. And my answer is no, they're, they're not. Like that's gone forever. Whatever company you were in, unless you were already a remote work company, however you were on January 1st, 2020, that's gone forever into the the ash pile of history. Because what happens is, now that we've extended, you know, had this extended period of remote work, people are choosing to live other places. They're choosing to wherever live, live a place they've always wanted to live, but couldn't, mm. um, because that's not where the job was. And, you know, most companies are going to be 
most people have had the experience of basically successfully working remotely for this company, whatever this company is we're talking about, for like a year. And a bunch of them just aren't going to be willing to move back. And a yeah. bunch of other companies are going to be willing to be okay with that. So mm. the companies who don't embrace it are going to be at a disadvantage in the, in the marketplace. Mm. It's really interesting. Um, I, I think a lot of companies have been um, using a remote workforce prior to this pandemic, when you think of outsourcing and things like that, um, to, you know, to, to gain some kind of advantage, um, whether it's the cost of the labor or whatever. Um, and then when you look at companies like GitLab, GitLab has been yeah. almost 100%, yeah, 100% remote, remote. Yeah. you know, from day one. Uh, Google is even going all remote now, right? Until at least next year? Uh, yeah, I think we've told people that they have the option uh, to work remotely until uh, June of 2021, I think is what we said. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of nuance in there. So, you know, GitLab's an interesting example. Well, lots of companies, but they're they're... It's good that you brought them up because they've been basically 100% remote work from the beginning. Um, and so they have this wonderful first mover advantage, right? Yeah, exactly. But that's like, you know, produce on a on a shelf. Like it's got a shelf life. It huh. does expire. Uh, and so it'll be really interesting to, to see like how do they lever that into some kind of advantage in, in their marketplace. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting topic. Yeah. Um, so going back to your undergraduate degree in business, you graduated in 1994 mm -hmm. and then, um, roughly what, six, five or six years later, you are selling a company that you co-founded for, you know, just under a billion dollars. How did you go from an undergraduate degree in business to being a co-founder and CTO of a company called Riverbed Technologies? Uh, well, there's a technical term for it. It's called luck. Um, <laughs> no, you know. And how do we reproduce that luck? Okay, so um, <laughs> I feel I'm going to give some uh, advice that I often give to people, but I want to caveat and say that it's most applicable to people in kind of technical disciplines, sort of so broadly speaking, technology. So um, if you can write software to make a computer do a thing. Uh, it turns out that you'll have to work really, really, really hard to be poor. Mm. Like to, to not have enough money to pay rent or eat food or live at sort of a, well, we'd recognize whatever country you're in as kind of a middle class uh, existence. Okay. Like you, you'd actually have a plan to sabotage yourself if you have that skill. Okay. Um, so what's really, so my, my, always my advice to people is unless you want a very vertical career where like, you know, I start as a junior salesperson or an inside sales rep and, you know, 15 years later, I'm a VP of sales at a place. So there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's not for you, then what you really should be doing is asking yourself, am I working on the thing that's most interesting for me to work on? Um, I think the worst thing in the world is boredom. Like my entire career is defined by running away from boredom. Uh, and that's how Riverbed happened to be perfectly honest. Um, in, in, um, Let's see, this would have been in 97. My wife bought me for my for my birthday a Palm Pilot. So people listening might not know what that is. Think of a smartphone without the phone bit. But that was really revolutionary at the time. The fact that you could carry around a thing and it would have all your contacts or whatever and you could write software for it. And I looked at this thing and I went, well, hold on. This is a computer and it runs on AA batteries. And I can write software for it in C, a language I know. Mm. Uh, and it's got a networking stack and some other stuff built in. And I was like, okay, this is clearly going to be important. I don't know how, but the entire benefit of computing has only benefited the front, the, uh, the back office, mainframes and minis and even PCs. These are things that sit in offices that people use basically. Cause you know, even in 97, very few people had computers in their home. And if you work on a clipboard, you know, if you, if you work outside of the office where your the computers are, you work on a clipboard or a legal pad. And finally, we have a thing that's cheap. It was like, I don't know, $200 mm -hmm. that runs on batteries forever that you can write software for that can replace a clipboard. And I was I was a, working at a consulting company at the time in Fall Church called Noble Star Systems. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, doing regular database stuff and whatever. And I remember going to the owner of the company and saying, this is going to be the thing. Like, this is the thing. This is an important moment. We should pay attention to this. I don't know how it's going to manifest, but like, this is, this is Star Trek. We have computers in our pockets now. <laughs> and he was... 
pretty skeptical and I understand why uh, at the time. And I was like, no, I really believe in this. And he's like, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, and I actually, I, I decided I didn't, I really wanted to go do this. So I quit. And uh, I got a phone call that day from a guy named Wayne Jackson, who now runs Sonatype, who was, who was the CEO and, and co-founder uh, of Riverbed with me. And he called me and he said, don't quit. I said, but I want to go do this thing. And I don't know where, but I'm going to go do this. And he said, well, why don't you come back on my group? Or you, he ran this, this sort of this R&D group called Emerging Technologies. Back at, at Noble Star? Yeah. Okay. And uh, he said, why don't you come work for me? And I'll give you a small team and a small budget. And why don't you see if you can sell, write software for companies on this thing and let's see if it works. So that was, I don't know, I guess it was, it must have been like 90, must have been 97, 96, probably 97. Um, and so I didn't quit or I unquit or something. <laughs> I left the federal systems group, which is where I was. And I went to the emerging technologies group. Oh. Um, and then uh, like a week later, two weeks later, there was this big uh, technology show in Washington, big for the federal government called Fosse. Uh-huh. And uh, I heard the Palm people who made the Palm Pilot were going to be there. And so I went because I'd heard there was going to be a new version coming out. And I wanted to find out about that. So I went and I met a person who turned out to be their head of sales, a guy named uh, Pat McVeigh. He's been a good friend for a long time. And we just got to talking. And I said, you know, I really think people, enterprises in particular will want custom software for these things. And I told him, you know, my crazy ideas for like 300 different things I thought an enterprise could do with a Palm Pilot. And he said, just hold on a minute. And he brought over this other person. Uh, who, who worked for him also in, in the sales team. And he said, uh, can you write software for this? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. I can do that. I've written some software. I showed him like a little bit of software. And he's like, we have companies asking us for software for these things. Uh, and we've had no one to do it. Mm. And I'm like, wow, well, I can fix that. <laughs> and so I started a, a, a small consulting practice called the Mobile Computing Group inside of Noble Star. No kidding. And we, yeah, we started writing custom software. And there was a time in in the whatever the end of the 90s where um if you were an enterprise if you had more than say 100 people and someone and you and you were running custom software on a palm pilot there was a better than 90 percent chance that that my team wrote it uh now it wasn't a big pool so don't get super impressed but one of the things but you know you know what it's like when you write software a lot you start to notice the things that are the common problems and, mm. and the obvious common problem was how do you move data from a big thing, mm -hmm. like a database on a server, to a little thing like a Palm Pilot and keep it synchronized? Like that was a really sort of an unsolved problem. There were a lot of limitations that you had to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so we just took a bunch of the bunch of the knowledge that we had and, and created this reusable platform, this piece of software that we could use. And um, I remember Wayne actually got into a little bit of a, the, an argument with the owner of Noble Star. Uh, a, a good guy, a guy named Paul Opalak, uh, who ended up being an investor in Riverbed, actually. He, he's a good guy. He's a smart guy. We got in kind of a an argument, and I remember Wayne uh, came into the office one time, and he closed the door, and he said, um, why don't you and I go do a startup? I said, I'm sorry? I don't know anything about startups. He said, yeah, you know, there are enough companies who want this software, and I agree with you uh, that this this sort of client-server technology that you built is is a good thing. Why don't we go out and get venture funding for mm. it? And so he went to Paul and he said, uh, we want to go do this. And Paul said, well, you know, I own it because you work for me, right? Right. <laughs> and Wayne said, hey, could I see a copy of my employment agreement? And Paul went through his files and files and realized that Wayne had never signed an employment agreement. Wow. So Paul wow. said, I'll tell you what. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I had no idea. And um, so Paul said, oh, well, I'll tell you what. He said, um, I forget when it was. This is probably like uh, September, October uh, of, uh, gosh, I don't know, 98 maybe. No, I, I don't remember the year. Anyways, late 90s. And he said to Wayne, like, I'll give you to the end of the year to see if you can raise a venture capital round. And if you can, we'll spin you out. And so Wayne and I went and we, gosh, we met with every VC, you know, in the D.C. area. And back then there were a bunch of them that you could imagine. And yeah. some of them were interested and some of them turned us down and whatever, whatever. And uh, finally we went to, uh, I guess it was FBR, Freeman Billings and Ramsey. And so we mm. went, uh, Gene Rickers and Hooks Johnson and, and a bunch of folks and Harry Weller, uh, who later went on to have an incredible career at NEA before he died and, uh, Scott Frederick and a bunch of the folks. And they looked at it and they went, yeah, okay, we agree. This is a thing. And there you go. And that's, that's how Riverbed came to be. 
That's such a great story. It, and it was great timing, too. It was a really frothy time for oh. all that stuff, yeah. all things tech. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so I remember, you know, starting working for you in the uh, toilet bowl building there in, in Tyson's Corner. Mm-hmm. And it, there was just so much excitement around it, especially I think there I think AOL there was a small office for AOL there in the building, I think. And I, I remember there running. Was, yeah. Yeah. They had, they had just moved. Uh, they had just built and moved into a large campus out in a, in, in a near Dulles airport. They were near I, MCI WorldCom and, but they still had an office in that building. So people listening, the reason it was called the toilet bowl building is in the front of the building was this giant roundish kind of arch that was like four stories tall. But yeah. when you looked at it head on, just it looked like you know it looked like the lip of a toilet bowl there was no other way and if you said to anyone in northern virginia oh it's across the street from the toilet bowl building they knew exactly what you meant yeah yeah it was, it was a great time i remember running into some of the aol people there and they're all talking about how much money they were making i was like man yeah. this is such a cool time yeah yeah no it, it was crazy yeah, yeah that all really started uh, in 95 at the Netscape IP. I remember when Netscape went IPO like management systems and it was my first job out of college and standing in my office when Netscape went IPO. And I remember thinking to myself, holy shit, like this is the web browser. Yeah. I was, I was, I was working with the source code on, you know, you know like a year before and they, they just went below. Okay. Something, something's definitely weird here. Yeah. Good stuff. So, um, changing gears a little bit, um, you've, you've done a lot of stuff since those days. Um, so you've been a co-founder of a couple companies, CTO, even a CEO. Um, what are some traits in your technical staff or your teams, um, from the companies that you've worked at that you've typically found lacking or, or hard to find in the workforce that you've, you've been pulling people from? Oh, if you can um, think of anything. Yeah. I mean, it's like anything. You got to go through a lot of people before you find exactly the, the people you think are going to fit. Um, you know, the thing I always look most for is do I think this is an honest person? Okay. Because um, almost everyone is smart enough um, to learn the skills, mm. uh, but they have to be self aware enough and honest enough to admit when, they, when they're short. Wow. Right. And, and so you're really looking for conscientious, honest people. Like that's mm-hmm. the most important thing okay. to me. If I know you're going to tell me the truth and you're going to be upfront with me about what you know and what you don't know and what, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the rest of it, we can kind of fill in, um, that like, and so I know that sounds weird, but that's actually the thing I, I care most about. And, you know, then I also look for a lot like naturally curious people. What do you do in your spare time? You know, whatever I guy, you know, I'm a beekeeper or something. Okay. Tell me about that. Mm-hmm. We, we used to have this interview question at Google that Sergey used to ask that we don't ask it anymore because we, we do more rigorous things, but, um, it was teach me. So he would just say, teach me something I don't already know, which mm. was a fantastic question, right? Cause you know, how does the person react and how do they discover what you don't already know? And then can they teach you something? You know, that was Feynman, Richard Feynman's whole thing. Uh, you don't really understand something so you can teach it to someone. Right. Um, so you're really looking for those kinds of people and the rest of it, all the individual technical skills, those are the things you can teach them where they can learn. Oh, that's interesting. So you look for honesty as an inherent I, trait. I look for honest, conscientious people who, who, who want to learn. Yeah. That's a great answer. Think, I love that. I mean, think about it. How many different programming languages have you had to write code in over? I mean, you probably learn a new one every couple of years, right? And, yeah. and, and different Technology, all of that stuff is temporary. It all goes away. Mm. Yep. Um, sure does. So, yeah, what's left is kind of your curiosity and and your your drive to learn mm. those things. Right. Cool. That was a really good answer. Um, so kind of along those lines, uh, I think you probably just answered that, but any other advice you can give, like software engineers and IT staff, kind of at all stages of their careers right now, any advice for improving their own personal brand and value in, in this day and day and age? Um, I don't know, geez, that's very life coachy kind of advice. Um, <laughs> so don't put yourself in a silo. Um, 
you you better be curious about the business of whatever business you're in. Like, don't just say my job is to write the software. Because honestly, if that's what you say to yourself, you can only write good software by luck. Mm. You should care about the business you're in and want to know mm. how the business works mm. and how okay. the business is doing. And if the business won't tell you how the business is doing, you're working in the wrong business. Go find another one to work for. Okay. Um, you should want to talk to customers. And they want to talk to you. That I can guarantee you. You should want and listen to them. And, and because, again, you can only write good software by luck uh, unless you, you're talking to the customers and know what they want. Right? And so just in the pursuit of being a good software engineer, you got to go an inch deep on finance and you have to go an inch deep on sales and you have to go an inch deep on product marketing and product management and, you know, all the things maybe you religiously avoid because I don't know how you can be a good software engineer without it. Mm. Like, I don't know how you could be a good salesperson without understanding how the system actually works. Right. Right. Or a good CFO without understanding, you know, how software development schedules are made or, 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 right. It's the typical thing where go deep in an area and then go shallow in a bunch of areas. Uh Uh-huh. So um, that's the only, it's the only way you can have any kind of real success. I love that. So it goes back to the question also, should I be a specialist in you know, one or a couple areas and be great at those areas? Or should I be more of a generalist and, you know, more of a generalist, I guess, and, and know a, a whole lot about a, a lot of different things. It depends on the kind of career you want. Um, I work with really some really smart people. Some of them are, are really hyper-focused specialists. They know not just about, uh, let's say, machine learning, but about really very dedicated areas in machine learning, like you know, language acquisition or something. Um, and that's fine. That's what they did their PhD in. That's what they've done their entire academic career on, et cetera, et cetera. And they are unbel- they're, they're the best in the world at those things. And that's fine if that's how they want to, uh, like there's a lot, of, a lot of need for that in the world. And if that's how they want to live their life, that's, that's awesome, good for them. Uh, I'm not that way. Um, I get bored pretty Mm. easily and boredom is like the worst thing in the world for me. Like it hurts. Um, and so when I get interested in a thing, I want to learn everything I can possibly learn about it. Like really, really learn it down to the atoms. And then I want to move on to something else. Mm. Uh, and there are pros and cons, you know, if you do the specialty thing, you are likely to go further faster, but you're also likely to hit a ceiling at some point. Right. And for some people, that ceiling is very high, so that's okay. Um, and if you're more of a generalist, generalist, which is kind of what I am, um, it will take you longer. Like you will go slower. You will be the tortoise in, mm. in, in the allegory. Um, but you, I think you will probably go further. But you'll have to work harder. Mm. Yeah, I, I love that idea of um, kind of what you mentioned about my my inference from what you said was don't spend so much time in the queue i mean you gotta you gotta be in your queue writing code but you also need to get out and talk to customers you need to get out and talk to sales and talk to your ceo and find out what the business is doing um i really like that uh that's hard to do um, especially when you're trying to be a good software engineer and and write you know code that's not all that buggy but it's not hard to do you know um it's, that's where I that's where I would like to uh, respectfully argue or disagree. Okay, it's it's not hard to do. It's not hard for you to say if you go to your manager or your department head or your CEO or like whatever kind of company you're in, and you'd say, "Hey, look, one day a month or two days a month, I want to go with the sales team on sales calls mm. and just be there to to help or just to listen or whatever." You know what they're going to say? Fuck yes, go, because <laughs> every customer wants to talk to the engineer. Uh-huh. And if you go to the salespeople, they're like, oh my God, they're, they're going to fight for that one or two days a month. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, and you can go to the people in the finance department and, and, and say, would you like to know how all this stuff works? Like, really? Would you like to know what it is you're accounting for? How it works, what we sell, why it matters, why our customers care, how it's built, how this idea turns into a thing? I am willing to teach you that. Mm. I will come and give a series of brown bags that will teach your staff how this works. And they'll be like, oh my God, yes. No one from engineering ever talks to us. Mm. Fantastic. But in exchange for which, you're going to teach me how some of this finance stuff works. How do we sell it? I don't mean they say yes, but then what? They sign a contract? How do we actually get the money? How, when does it turn into money for us? How do we get to recognize? Like all those kinds of things, right? Mm. You go learn that. Go be curious. Mm. Yeah, love that. Um Cindy and I uh, listened to Jeff Hoffman. You know who Jeff Hoffman is, founder of Priceline.com? 
Um, I didn't, but now I do. Yeah, he uh, he was started out as a software engineer, and one of the great takeaways I took from him was his realization that he needed to get out of his cube for writing code and, and go talk, just like you said, just go up, go talk to people, go find out what their problems are, and, and take them to heart, and then find solutions for those problems. And that was, he said, a, a great turning point in his own life, from becoming you know just a regular software engineer to a billionaire. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think I, pro- I probably at some point in, in our life said this to you, right? That the thing you're really interested in, if no one else cares, we have a word for it. It's called a hobby. Yeah. Uh, and if everyone else cares, we have another word. It's called an opportunity. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, so what are... Go ahead, Cindy. Got a question? Oh, I was just going to say that's that's really excellent advice, especially like given people who are trying to find their passion, be it college kids or people who are working through career transition. So I really like that philosophy of if other people care, and so trying to really explore that with others and uh, and uh, then kind of find your own way. So I thought that was really wise. So thank you. Oh, well, okay, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I think the most important thing for someone to to really internalize is. Um, that it's not a sin to fail, right? The sin is failing to notice. Mm. Um, like, go do a thing. And if it doesn't work, like, get really good at I figuring out it. it's not working and then go do something else. Like, eventually you'll run out of ways to fail and we'll succeed. So how do you deal with fa- failure? Uh, roughly that way. Like okay. I, I, when, I, when I go to do a thing, I, I try to ask myself, how will I know if this is working and how long am I going to give it? And by the way, that's a lesson learned desperately, deeply the hard way. Um, so, and, and then I stick to it. Okay. This is not going that way. All right. Well then it's at a minimum, a failure of forecasting, let's call it right. A failure of, of, of anticipating what the future is going to be. Okay. What do I need to change? Like, am I doing it wrong? Is it the wrong thing to be doing? Um, you know, failure is the only way you learn anything. Really. You don't yeah. learn anything from your successes, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, or not much anyway. And so you just, you got to get really good at recognizing when it's not working and pretty ruthless about saying it's not working and it's probably me. And so what do I have to do to either make it work or go do something else? Cause there's no shortage of other things to do. Would you be willing to share an example? Oh, I mean, I have many of them. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. What's a good example. Okay. You're going to laugh. Well, James will laugh. Um, yeah, Riverbed was a raging success. We did it and we sold it for a bunch of money and who could possibly complain? Except here's the thing. I was wrong. And and James was right. And he probably won't remember this, but um, that software, I was relentless. I said that this, this server software, we're going to write, we're going to write for Windows. We're going to write for Windows NT because big enterprises use Windows NT. And because someday we might like to get acquired and our, one of our, you know, uh, best possible matches for acquisition is Microsoft. And so we're going to write this stuff in windows. And I was really dogmatic about it. And I do remember not long after James started and we were, so we wrote it in windows and we wrote it in C and C plus plus. And I remember not long when James started, uh, he came and said, well, maybe this is right, but it's not the future. It's like the future is Linux and the future is Java. And I went, whatever. <laughs> Um, James. Yeah, whatever. But, you know, I was like, all right, if you want to go try to do a Linux version with Java, you know, Zygazon, go with God. Um, and he did. And it wasn't the thing I think that, that, that sold the company. Um, but I will, I will sit here and say, like, if we hadn't been in that moment of time and had to try to run the company for two or three years more, uh, we'd have been in a, in a hell of a pickle just having it all just on windows. Uh, so actually you were right. It didn't turn out to matter in that particular case, but um, I, more than once I have looked back on that, um, honestly, and mm-hmm. said, well, okay, maybe this crazy idea this person's coming to me with, we should give them a little, just to go try and see. Maybe it's just a good idea to have this in our back pocket. Like, that's that's an obvious thing. Um, you know, I was probably wrong to, just, to want to be a finance major in college. Failing two classes did not help my GPA. Mm-hmm. Uh, I probably should have just been a computer science major. Now, in my defense, I didn't know that was a major that you could do. Mm. <laughs> um, 
And I probably should have just taken the extra year in school and just transferred into the computer science department. Um, uh, what else? Reality Mobile. That's an interesting case. I learned a bunch of hard lessons that way. Um, nominally, we sold the company, but for not very much. Um, and I, I poured a lot of personal money into it. Uh, and I and I invested way past my red line, you know, where I said, like, go no further. Mm. And I went further and went way further. Uh, and it, you know, it it caused real problems in my life for, for a few years. Wow. Um, so, well, you know, learn a hard lesson the hard way. All right. So you got to be, even for the things you really care about, you have to be really clear-eyed about whether you're succeeding or not and draw some lines mm. and, and know how you're going to adjust. You know, what was, uh, who was it? I think it was, um, it was Seneca, Seneca the Younger, I think, um, who said, uh, Arari humanum est sed in Arari perseverari diabolicum. To err is human, but to persist knowingly in error is diabolical of the devil. And what he meant is like the most human thing in the world is to make mistakes, well-intentioned yeah. mistakes. Oh. It is. Um, but what's truly diabolical is to keep doing the thing you know you're not doing well just because you don't know what else to do. Hmm. Like flip a coin, go do something else. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. We all we all fail all the time. Yes, that's the other thing is you you know we'd all be better if we were less bashful about our failures. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, more transparency is really powerful, and it, it helps to build trust. I feel like too. Would you agree yeah, with that? I'm, yeah, yeah, I, I do. I think ruthless transparency is really. You should be as transparent as you possibly can. I, I, I think one of the things leaders fail at is leaders are good. Good leaders are good at saying, I don't know. That's good. Good for them. And, 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 you know, so like a, let's call it an average leader. If you ask them a question, we'll give you the answer. Like that's a you know, kind of an average leader. A good leader uh, will say, I don't know when they don't know. The best leader, the rarest one, I think, will say, I know, but can't tell you because. And tell you why they can't tell you. That seems to be the answer most leaders, excuse me, avoid. Yeah, and that's uh, really powerful to show that vulnerability with your staff, I feel like. So that's, I love that. Adding it to the leadership curriculum. <laughs> that's good stuff. So uh, I wanted to ask you also what you thought made the Google engineer, such a mythical, mythically great, you know, commodity. We hear so much about the Google engineers and everywhere I've worked, um, somebody has wanted some feature that Google has developed something like Google maps or something like Google search and wanted, wanted us to implement it and couldn't understand why we couldn't because Google has it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's a combination of things. I think, um, you know, the culture of your team or your company is whoever the first five people are you hire, basically. Um, and it just all kind of goes from there. And um, Larry and Sergey, and then later Eric and a few other people were pretty relentless that they would only hire the smartest people they could find. And then when they thought they had found the sm smartest person, they'd look a little more. Mm. And they made hiring super slow. Uh, but they did manage to hire some ungodly smart people in those in those early days. Uh, you know, Jeff Dean, who, who runs all of machine learning at Google and has been there forever. You know, and Ben Smith and Ben Gomes and 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 a name you probably don't know, but it, it, you really people ought to know, like Urs Helsla, who runs all technical infrastructure at Google, designed all the servers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, they were relentless. They, they said, "We're going to hire this not just the smartest people of of, of a generation. We're going to hire the smartest people there are." period. Uh, and that becomes self-fulfilling in a way, you know, then smart people want to work with smart people, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, and then they figured out some way to govern that. I'm not quite sure I totally understand it because it's a pretty different company now than it was say 20 years ago, but, um, they figured out some way to govern it, uh, and to motivate people. Um, there's a, there's a story, uh, they've talked about it publicly where, um, in the early days where, uh, the engineers came in one day and there was a note from Sergey on a refrigerator. It was a screen capture of some ad that had been next to a web page. Um, and it just said, this sucks. All right, like the whatever, the quality of our selection of this ad for this page, or whatever, whatever, something, th this sucks. That's all it said was, this sucks. And they were like, well, that's no good. We can't have that. And they just 
I don't know. They went off and rewrote some unbelievable, amazing thing. Um, so I'm, it's a, it's a mixture of hire the smartest people you can and, uh, but smart and conscientious, like people who really want to achieve or that's important to them, which means by the way, hiring a lot of neurotic people, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, but if I had to guess, I'd say 90% of the people at Google suffer pretty seriously from imposter syndrome. They're all convinced they're the mistake. Interesting. I'm I'm a hundred percent convinced I'm the mistake for years, (laughs) for years. I had a shirt. Um, which they asked me to stop wearing because it was freaking out other people. But um, for years, you know, we we do uh, our performance reviews twice yearly. It's called Perf, and I used to have this shirt that I had made, uh, this black shirt that had uh, two fingerprints on my right shoulder, and it just on the back it said, "When it's time, just tap me here," and I'd wear it during Perf season, um, because that's how I felt. Like I have no idea how these people hired me. It was clearly an accident. Like I wow. saw through. Maybe if I'm just quiet, they won't realize. You know, imposter syndrome, it's, it, imposter syndrome is such a phenomenon within our culture today, and I, I'm curious how that developed. And and uh, did this? Did the people in the 50s and 60s have the same the same feeling of getting into a spot where you think you don't aren't successful, don't have that confidence? Um, it, it's really interesting. Or how have we created this in organizations where people feel like um, they aren't worthy of being there? And how do we change that? Um, so I'm going to say a very unpopular thing. I don't think we should. Mm. Hey, Interesting. I, I, I think it's um, I think it's just a characteristic of people, not all people. We've all met the other people who are just convinced they should be there when really they shouldn't. <laughs> okay, true. Um, we call them bozos. But um, <laughs> no, I mean you could imagine, you could squint and kind of imagine the uh, biological advantage to imposter syndrome. Right? It makes you work a little bit harder or a lot of bit harder. Um, and stay up those extra nights to really learn a thing. Cause you just like, there is no better imperative to do a thing than the feeling that you're behind and are going to get caught. Mm. Like I can't think of a more terrifying thing other than I'm going to get eaten by a mountain lion or something. Um, it is a little like being chased by a bear. Mm. Uh, and it's very motivating. It's destructive too. That's, I mean, you know, it's not good for people, but it's super motivating. And um, I, th- I imagine if you, survey a lot of successful people. I think this is I think this is what I read in the literature that, you know, some ridiculously number of high percentage of CEOs, et cetera, et cetera, self report as having imposter syndrome. I just I think to work that hard and be that successful, you have to be kind of neurotic. It just mm. it just it has to like I won't go to bed if I have more than ten emails in my inbox. I don't mean ten unread emails. I mean ten emails, period. I just can't do it. It's not healthy. Uh, and I don't advocate anyone choose to do that, but it's how I am. Uh, and so I got a lot of stuff done. And I think a lot of people are that way. So how do you manage your energy then between the personal and professional? Uh, I'm terrible. <laughs> Again, okay. you shouldn't take a lesson from me. Uh, my <laughs> wife has said more than once that if you thought of my personal life and my professional life or my work-life balance, is how she'd say it. If you think mm. of his work-life balance as a Venn diagram, it's just a circle. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, I like to work. Uh, I enjoy what I do. Uh, I'm one of those uh, pathetic creatures for whom work uh, defines a big chunk of who I am. Oh. I think if I couldn't work, that would be really bad. Oh, man. Uh, my brain bored is a terrible thing. Like, that's not good. You know, I love my brain, but it hates me. So I'll tell <laughs> people. Um, so, you know, I need to work. I need to be busy. So then where do you see yourself in 10 years? Do you ever see, um, consider yourself retiring? No, I think uh, all that will happen is I will get to a place. I don't think people who are uh, who have imposter syndrome or people who are neurotic in the kind of way that I am, or I think a lot of people are, but certainly I am, ever really retire. They don't mm. stop. That's just not a thing. You can't. I do think they get to a place where they can pick their shots. You know, they, they acquire the money they need or the security they need or whatever, and then they can just go be neurotic in some other uh domain <laughs> and that's fine i'll 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 be neurotic in some other domain that's okay um but yeah i'll never stop that's just stopping it's not a thing i can't i can't imagine it mm. actually i can't imagine it and it terrifies the hell out of me mm. so do you have a vision for what that domain could look like do you have any hobbies that you really want to bring to light or get back into software engineering just to, from a coding perspective what, what's I your still, passion yeah well uh, the two things um the way I spend my free time, 
Oh, uh, it's just code for time when I ought to be sleeping. Is um, I do like to. I still write code. I like it. I I really enjoy writing code, just even to do small things. But I really like writing software. It's a uniquely satisfying experience. I'm with you on I, that. I, yeah, I just it really is, and it works, and it's just it's wonderful, and and it's sort of permanent in its way. Hmm. So I like that. And then uh, I've been a professional musician for, I don't know, 26, 27 years. What? And, uh, yeah. So what do you play? Yeah. Uh, things with keys. Piano, organ, harp score, clavinet. No you kidding. Know. Yeah. That's amazing. I actually, uh, actually wrote Google's on hold music. Really? Yeah. I must call them. <laughs> uh, if you can find the number, good luck. Um, but yeah, if you, if you call the support line, one of the songs playing will be mine. What support line? Uh, let's see. I know it's playing on the cloud support line. No kidding. That's yeah. awesome. So, uh, music's a passion of mine. Always has been. That's probably if I... Well, that's what I want it to be. So, that's the uh, that's an interesting... I don't know if most people... Well, maybe they can. But uh, I can tell you how I became me, if that makes any sense. Please um, do. Good or bad. When I was a kid, when I was a little kid... I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. I was going to be a professional musician. I was going to be a concert pianist, actually. I was going to be a touring concert pianist. No kidding. I knew from the time I was very, very small. Like three oh, this is good. Uh, I was absolutely certain of it. And uh, like for my fifth birthday, I asked for piano lessons. That was my that was my fifth birthday present because I wanted to go do this. And I was certain of it. I had my whole life mapped out. I knew what I was going to do. When I turned 13, I was going to go compete and win, of course, in the in the most prestigious music competition at the time in the United States, which was the Van Cliburns in Texas. And then when I was, uh, I don't know, 16 or 17, whatever the minimum age was, I was going to go to what was then the Soviet Union uh, and compete in the Tchaikovsky's, which was the, the large international music competition. I was going to win that, of course, because what kid thinks he's going to lose? Uh, and then I was going to spend my, my life uh, touring as a concert pianist. Like, I, you know, I checked out books. On, <laughs> I, ch I checked out books on teaching yourself Russian and French. No Russian, kidding. I figured you, you got to know a few phrases if you're going to, if you're going to go compete in, in the Soviet Union huh. and French, because it's obviously true that classical musicians hadn't had to speak French. Um, it tells you, you know, the mind of a seven year old or something. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, and I certainly, I really dedicated myself to, it and I was quite good. And, uh, if I do say so, and no, but I, I mean, I was quite good and I was winning sort of local competitions and doing really well. And then, um, when I was, let's see, this would be the summer of 83. So I'd have been 11. When I was 11, I got into this really freak accident. This terrible, awful freak accident and lost the use of my left arm for a year. No kidding. Yeah, I almost had to have it amputated. It was a real, it was a real mess. Uh, and that was the end of that dream. Like, I don't feel anything below my left elbow. What was uh, the accident? <laughs> Believe it or not, playing basketball. No kidding. Yeah, I slipped on, I was playing a friend. It was the, it was the last day of school in 1983. So it was May something. And uh, I slipped on a puddle in a friend's driveway and went up in the air and landed straight on my elbow. And because of an oddity of the just the way I am constructed, it wound up destroying all the bones below my elbow, all the muscles, all the tendons, all the nerves. Wow. It was just jello. It was terrible. Uh, so I lost all, all use below the elbow of my left arm, and they thought they were going to have to amputate. And that's a whole long story. Wow. And, but the, the important event the, the, is uh, I was in the – so back then – uh, there were no MRIs, or uh, maybe there were, but not, not in 1983, not, in, not where I was, not in Washington. And so the only way they could know what was going on is they did exploratory surgery. They put you under and they cut you open and they looked around. Mm. And so they went in and they, they put me under and they cut me open and they looked around. And um, they came out and told my parents, like, it's a mess. He's never going to use this again. Like, it's, it's done. We think you should amputate. Mm. And they were like, yeah, no. Go put Humpty Dumpty back together. Do your best. And they were like, well, I mean, they were like, we can mend the bones. We can do that and reattach whatever they can reattach. But, like, he's not going to use this again. And they're like, we're not going to have our 11-year-old wake up without an arm. Like, this is the kid who's been training, you know, yeah. his, his conscious life to be a concert pianist. Like, it'll kill him. Wow. Like, we're just not ready for They just weren't emotionally ready to say yes to that, which God yeah. bless them. Well, I don't think it was any great determination so much. It's just like, as a parent, I can't do that. And so I woke up in the hospital, uh, arm all bandaged up, whatever doctor came in, and he took this thing that looked a little bit like a pizza cutter, and he ran it across my palm. He said, can you feel that? And I said, no. And he said, can you move your fingers? I said, no. And he said, you know, you're a pretty bright kid, so I'm just going to tell it to you. You're never going to use this arm again. Wow. Went, oh, I'm not, am I? And he said, no, here's what happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, 
I don't think it's going to grow. And he said, but even if it does, it's going to be withered. And there's a pretty good chance that somebody at some point is going to have to amputate it because it's just going to be a danger to you. And I don't remember exactly the words I thought in my brain. I, I know the words I would say in my brain now, but they're definitely not the words I would say as an 11 year old. Cause I don't think I knew those words back then, but it was something analogous to, well, fuck you. Let, yeah. Let's just, let's just go see. Yeah. And I did. And I spent a couple of years and a lot of rehab and a bunch of surgeries and, and some experimental treatments and all kind of weird stuff. Uh, and I finally got the use of my arm, not good enough to be the kind of concert pianist I wanted to be. That dream died. Mm. That, that, that's mm. gone. But I could play lots of other things that didn't require exactly that de dexterity. Mm. Um, but that was the that was the day a dream died, but kind of the rest of my world opened uh, because I learned something the, over the time, which is you can outwork just about anything, you know, within sort of the laws of physics. Uh -huh. Like I ought not be able to use my arm, but I can. Right. And if you and if you didn't know this, I mean, you know, I had no idea. You, there you go, right? You probably I had never no noticed idea. a giant scar on my left arm. But, never noticed. Um, yeah. And so um, that was a really valuable thing for me is I learned. I learned like it's only too hard if you quit. I love so that. Quit. Love that. And it sounds like a don't accept what other people put on you. So don't accept yeah. if somebody says you can't do this or you're yeah, not good enough for anything else. Yeah. Yeah. The way I used to think of it is – um when somebody would say to you or say to me or whatever, the odds of you succeeding are, and then give you some vanishingly small number. <laughs> but I always felt like they were uh, leaving off the most important part of that sentence, which was given an expected level of effort. Mm. Mm. Right. Well, what if I give an right. unexpected level of effort? <laughs> then what do my odds look like? I love that. Oh, they go up a lot, do they? Great. I'm going to go do that. <laughs> love that. And so I've been uh, fairly allergic probably a majority of my time to my benefit, but definitely notably to my disadvantage. Uh, I've been pretty allergic to people telling me like, you can't do that or that's not possible. I mean, if it's not possible, like the physics don't work, that's a different thing. Okay. You mm. know, I can't break a, break a law of nature, but if it's not possible, like which is really just code for, I don't think you can do it. Oh, is that right now? Oh, okay. You okay. hold my beer. So you were, <laughs> Yeah, you you were able to defy your doctor and get use of your arm back, but why weren't you able to? Do you think become a concert pianist still? Physics. I, I don't feel anything below my left elbow, and okay. uh, I just don't have the dexterity in my left hand, and frankly, the feel that is required. Okay. Uh, I know. I, I I didn't play piano for a couple of years because every time I'd sit down to play, it would just make me sad because mm. it w it wasn't possible for me to play the way I could hear it in my head the way I knew it had to be played to have the kind of life and career that I wanted. Right. I knew very definitely what good sounded like. Uh, and I wasn't ever going to be that kind of good. And I'm not still that kind of good. I uh -huh. mean, for other kinds of things, I can play in a band and I can play in a session and, and I'm a pretty reasonable jazz pianist and some other stuff, but that doesn't require anywhere near the kind of uh, uh, nuance and touch and texture uh, in the left hand that being really world-class uh classical pianist requires mm. just, and it, i'm not capable of it that is a place where the physics just aren't going to work yeah i love that and so here's another here's another repeating pattern for dreams that i'm noticing is that uh people can have these great dreams and think that they can't achieve them and then something happens and you just can't like there's something life says i'm sorry you're not you're not going to get there however your journey to that has improved your life in some way. And I'm, I'm sure you still take great joy out of playing piano. Sure. Or, and, and it's a, it's, it's a hobby in your life now that you still derive a tremendous amount of benefit from. Yeah. Well, and, and the other big things too, right? Like uh, I was, I was going to go to a different school on a wrestling scholarship. And if I'd gone to school on a wrestling scholarship, I don't know, I've had some kind of trajectory in life, but I certainly wouldn't have done riverbed. Wouldn't mm. happen because mm. I went to Maryland. And, and I got a job in the, you know, in the, in, in the college of engineering being a systems programmer. And I stayed in the Maryland DC area and I met my wife and like a lot of things wouldn't have happened. Um, if I hadn't torn that rotator cuff my mm. senior year. Yeah. Love that. That's a really great story. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, no worries. I had 
that's one of the things I love about podcasts is because I learned so much about people that, you know, especially from Cindy. I, the, the first podcast we did was uh, between the two of us. And I learned so much about her just by talking on the podcast with her. So I love all these little details that come out about people. Um, Cindy, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask at this point? Um, no, but uh, it's coming up on an hour or so. Okay, I, I do have a couple things I wanted to, to a couple sure. more questions I want to run by you before we go. Sure. Um, so going back to the technical thing and where you think the next five and ten years are for for people working in software engineering or IT or whatever, what do you think are some things that these people need to focus on? People like me, in software engineering, need to kind of focus on to prepare for the next five to ten years, whether it's AI or machine learning or is there something else that you think yeah, you need every- to be Everybody should do, you know, a short-ish Coursera course or something uh, on machine learning. You need to understand what it is and generally how it works. You don't have to necessarily understand all the math behind it, just like, you you know, most people don't understand the math behind Mm. compiler theory. Um, But you better understand what it is and why it works. Mm. Because not only is it not going, not only is it not going away, it's going to be a central feature of, of all systems for, well, I don't know, forever. But certainly for the foreseeable future. Um, so if you don't have that skill and aren't interested in that skill, you are you are not in good shape. That's good. Okay. Uh, uh, that's I think that's a that's a big one. And that you know, that's where I got lucky. Having a degree in statistics uh, gives me a grounding to be able to understand some, not all, but some of the math behind, or enough of it anyway, to be go just a hair further than than sort of the applied stuff. Not not nearly as far theoretically as other people, but you know enough to to really kind of understand how it connects to things. Mm. Anything else? Gee, pops pops here. Key to kingdom. Um, <laughs> let's see. No, I'm kidding. Um, let's see. If I were a software developer, um, learn the whole stack. Okay. I don't think I don't think you should ever settle for saying I'm a back end developer. Yep, I agree with that. Cute. Go go go! Learn to write a client UI. Yeah, love that. Right, and go go learn the terrible jumbled mess that is front end programming these days. Yeah, because it's frustrating, and confusing, but you know you better know how this stuff works. Like it's important. Uh huh. Um, go how to go learn how to write things. Teach yourself how to write things uh, that fail gracefully. Mm. The thing you will, the thing you're writing will fail. Can you make? Do you have the are you smart enough to figure out how to make it fail gracefully instead of catastrophically? Mm. Like you want things to fail gracefully. Otherwise they'll fail slowly until they don't fail slowly until they fail catastrophically. Mm. That's a, a set of skills. I think people neglect, but most importantly, um, again, if you're, if you're a software person, go do the thing that is most interesting to you right now. And then you'll do something different in a couple of years because you, you can't be poor being a software developer. Even mm. if you're a software developer working in an area that's really interesting to you, you're still going to find someone who need, who wants to pay you money. Maybe you won't get rich today. But when I was in school, I thought neural networks were just the neatest thing, just the bee's knees, man. Holy cow, we can get computers to, to learn things. That would mm. just be awesome. And my instructors were like, that is dead. Really? Don't do it. You'd be wasting your time. Yeah. The, mm. the, sort of the three-tier forward feedback we're propagating Neural network was was just it was it was it was dead letter. It was never going to happen. Mm. Um, and that was I mean that was dogma in the early and mid nineties uh, when I was in school. And and you know I read a couple books but didn't really do anything with it. And meanwhile, a bunch of people, Jeff Hinton and other people, just beavered away on it because they believed in it and it's just it's where their passion was. And then wouldn't you know it, right? The circle of life turns around, and now exactly those kinds of neural networks right. are what's underneath the machine learning that the world uses now. Mm. It just turns out we didn't have the scale to run them, but now we do. And so that that's one of many lessons about, or all the people that failed in mobile computing before the Palm Pilot, the people who did the Zorus and the, the Apple Newton and all kinds of other things, but the people who had a passion for it, who really stuck with it, you know, they, they did okay after the iPhone came around. Mm. Um, so do the thing that you love as a software developer. It'll be very hard to go broke. I mean, it will also be hard to get rich for a while anyway, but yeah. eventually you'll get your day in the sun and then, you know, sun shines, right? Go make, go make hay while the sun shines. <laughs> All right. Where's mobile going now? No, I don't know. 
Um, You're done with mobile you know, a long I time think, ago. Uh, prob- probably, I think it's uh, it's still wearables. Yeah, it's different kinds of things that are on you. Um, you know, there's some. I don't know. Mm, let's see. IoT is such a buzzword. It is certainly going to be true that more things are going to be connected to a network because the yeah. advantage they gain from being connected to a network is too high to be not. Uh, I don't know if I quite call it IoT. And there's still a long way to go uh, for those things to be okay, but that's definitely going to be an area. Uh, wearables in particular are going to be a thing. I, you know, you're going to laugh. And I don't know if it'll, maybe it'll be in my lifetime. Uh, but the other Elon Musk company, what is it called? Uh, Neuralink? Where he wants to do human brain interfaces? Mm-hmm. You know, someday that is going to be true. Yeah. I don't know what day that will be, but someday that is going to be true. Someday the computer is going to be able to write the code. We're already there almost. And not G- quite. GPT-13? Yeah, uh, not not quite, if you've played with that model at all. I mean, it's interesting, uh, but it's not not quite there Not yet. quite there. But, um, but you know, like you can squint and see a future in five or 10 years. Like if one of my kids yeah. uh, said they wanted to be a software developer, I would, I would tell them really you need to get into machine learning, not just because it's the hot thing today, but because it will be machine learning writing the code in not very long. And so you need to, you need to be sitting in the place that's abstracted one layer from it. That's yeah. telling the machine what kind of system you want it to build. Yeah. I saw a good quote recently. I uh, just paraphrase. I think it was something like, Learn how to, instead of uh, telling a machine what to do, learn how to tell a machine how to learn what to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was really, uh, you know, really interesting. Way to look another at it. Thing, yeah, another thing I like to tell people is most of us live in a world where we work for the machine. How about you figure out how to live in a world where the machine works for you? Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, our future is going to be defined by by us and our dreams, not by our fears at least it's the way it should be well and the beautiful thing is um humans are terrible computers yes i know the word computer actually came from humans who computed things but humans are terrible machines but guess what machines are terrible humans (laughs) no they really are yeah machines you actually can't program a machine to have intuition you can't you can program a machine to learn things and be good at making decisions some kinds of decisions classifications binary classifications mostly but um but you can't teach a machine to have an intuition. Like there are a set of things that only the human animal can do. Now, machines will encroach. You know, certain tasks for which we use intuition today that we will teach a machine to be good at. But that doesn't mean the machine has intuition. And yeah. we are much smarter than the machine uh, about dreaming up the kinds of problems we want to solve. Right. So there will always be a place for us. But you better be flexible about where you are there. Yeah. I love that. I think on that note, that's that's where we'll close things off. We're about an hour, and uh, it's been a pleasure catching up with you again, and and hearing your hearing your philosophies on technology and business and all that. It's it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Dave. Uh, entirely my pleasure. Let's make it maybe not so long next time. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll have to look at look for an excuse to talk to you again sometime. You know, just to say hi would be fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, when are you coming back to Virginia? Uh, I don't have any concrete plans to uh, to get back east anytime uh, or get that part of the country anytime soon, but yeah. I don't know. When, whenever, you know, whenever it's not masks and face shields in an aluminum death tube. <laughs> um, I Yeah, beats me. I'm sure I'll be back at some point. I'll yeah. let you know. All right, cool. Same thing if you guys ever get to California. Yeah, totally. All right, thanks so much. It's great having you on here. My pleasure, James. Cindy, cool. lovely to talk to you too. You as well. We'll be in touch. Take care. All right. See you Bye. later.